Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Caroline McGraw with The Clearing, and today we are thrilled to be here with Dr. Richard Friedman, who is a professor of clinical psychiatry and the director of Psychopharmacology Clinic at Weill Cornell Medical College in New York City. He is an expert on the neurobiology and treatment of mood and anxiety disorders. He has done a great deal of research in depression. He is also a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times, and his column deals with mental health, addiction, human behavior, and neuroscience. So welcome, Dr. Friedman. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Pleasure to be here. So in your recent Sunday review piece on food and drug addiction, which was wonderfully titled, What Cookies and Meth Have in Common, I loved that, you discussed how humans have designed an environment that is ideal for food and drug addiction. What are the defining characteristics of this environment? So what we've done is we have extracted from natural materials on the earth and designed foods that have really, really high concentrations of nutrients that are usually present in low concentrations in natural foods like fruits and vegetables. So we have things like fast food and fried food, you know, really calorie dense foods that are highly appealing that, you know, you, you've got like a Twinkie, which is essentially all sugar and all fat, or you have, you know, chocolate ice cream, which is, you know, got a little protein, it's true, and chocolate is good for you in certain amounts, but it has a lot of fat and a lot of sugar. So we've created these foods that we've never really evolved around um, mm -hmm. that expose us, our brains, to, you know, these really, really calorie dense foods and those are different and have an effect on our brain which is very different than the kinds of substances in the foods that we would have eaten over many millions of years of evolution mm -hmm. and in a similar way we've extracted from plants initially drugs that are highly rewarding and highly um, desirable like we figured out how to make alcohol from fermenting grain. Mm -hmm. We figured out how to uh, extract from the opium poppy opium. And then we figured out how to synthesize ever more powerful synthetic opioids, in, you know, like morphine and then the synthetics, like oxycontin and oxycodone and Percocet. And then finally, drugs that are terrifyingly potent, like fentanyl, mm -hmm. of which people are dying, you know, um, overdoses all over the country and are fueling the opioid crisis. So humans have figured out ways to identify these highly rewarding compounds, concentrate them and present them to the rest of humanity. It's an amazing accomplishment, but I could see how it's dangerous too. Yes, very dangerous. Um, so essentially our biology has not caught up with our innovation yet. We, we're not evolved to handle this. <laughs> Right. We're not, well, we're evolved to handle rewards that are not quite that powerful. Mm -hmm. And the reason they're dangerous is because they can really hijack the brain's reward center and bring about addictive behavior. So, you know, we have a reward center in our brain, which is the site of, you know, the action of all recreational drugs. They all act on the reward center to produce a signal that basically says, hey, this is a really important experience. Don't forget about it. And mm -hmm. to generate a sense of craving, wanting, and pleasure. So everyday things that are pleasurable, like a sunset, um, good sex, good food, they activate the reward pathway in a certain at a certain level. Let's say from here to here. But mm -hmm. if you give somebody a drug like opium or mm -hmm. heroin, the relative stimulation and activation of the center and the ward center is much, much greater, much greater than anything we've ever grown up around. Mm -hmm. So and it's more powerful. So once you've had that, everything by comparison seems relatively duller. So an everyday reward like great sex, beautiful sunset, wonderful food pales by comparison to these man-made powerful rewards like drugs. Mm -hmm. And then when we throw stress into the picture, you've written about how stress and addiction are intricately connected and that often you have these stressors that you want to escape from and then you, you turn to the, the highest reward. Right. And stress actually produces biological changes in our brain 
it renders us more likely to crave drugs. It mm -hmm. literally changes the preference in, in the reward center in your brain, so you're more likely to want to use drugs. Wow. Um, and probably is right at the heart of the opioid epidemic in the United States, where people who previously were never drug addicts, right, you know, white working class Americans mm -hmm. in, in the Rust Belt, um, that's the largest source of mortality right now among middle class whites. It's not natural car deaths like heart attacks or strokes. It's opiate overdoses. Hmm. Now, what's driving that? I mean, why are people why are people suddenly using so many opiates and getting addicted and dying? Well, one possible explanation is social. The social stress hmm. that many Americans have experienced, you know, from the economy, from the loss of social fortune, from all of these things, is enormously stressful. And it's changed the biology of their brain and made them more vulnerable to addiction. Wow. You perfectly anticipated. <laughs> My next question was, can you talk about some of the levels of stressors, be they physical or social or emotional stressors? What are most likely to precipitate addiction? I think, you know, the, the scenario of being trapped in a situation mm. where stress is chronic and you don't see a way out, that's the bad kind of stress. You know, acute stress is healthy, you know, like a challenge mm -hmm. or, you know, you have to give a lecture or you have to take a chance and stand out and you have to do something which is kind of a little outside your comfort zone, but you're going to, it's brief. Right. You're going to have exposure and then you're going to be able to go back to your comfort that's an acute stress and that produces growth, you know, mm -hmm. emotionally, biologically, psychologically, in every way. But if you have chronic stress that you can't escape from, that's mm -hmm. harmful biologically and psychologically. It's like having a pebble in your shoe that you can't take off and you have to learn to walk with this. So what happens? You limp. And likewise, if you're exposed to chronic stress, then biologically it has a bad effect on your brain and on mood and mm -hmm. all kinds of other functions. Right. It's the difference between you're giving a TED talk, which is, you know, very stressful and very exciting, but it's there's a growth factor and it's a short term thing versus right. you're in a job that you, you don't like and you are just you really don't want to be there and you feel trapped day after day after day. Right. And that and that second scenario you mentioned is incredibly stressful and gives people all kinds of mental and physical illnesses like it's associated with diabetes, hypertension the risk of mortality goes up. And it's also associated with depression because it's a, it's a form of learned helplessness where mm. you feel trapped and you can't actually figure out a way to get out of it. Exactly. And that's a great lead into how mental health issues and addiction interrelate. And you had written a column about how it's, it's become a troubling trend that people are using drugs such as LSD to self-medicate for their mental health conditions. So why is it that folks with mental health conditions are more vulnerable? Well, I mean, there's a non-specific reason, mm -hmm. right? Because they're feeling various forms of psychic pain, which they would like to escape mm -hmm. and alter your mental state into, you know, an excursion, let's say, into feeling high from cannabis or relaxed from alcohol or relaxed from a drug like Valium or Clonopin. It can take away undesirable emotions and undesirable thoughts, right? Or at least mitigate them. Mm -hmm. So it's an attempt, it's a sort of self-medication attempt to deal with painful states of emotion and thinking. But the problem is it's not a very good solution mm. because often the solution, if it's a recreational drug, creates another problem Yes, that is doesn't necessarily make the depression better. In fact, it might make it worse. Some of the drugs that people use to medicate depression and anxiety bring about depression and anxiety, unwittingly. Mm -hmm. exactly. exactly. Wow, that's powerful. And you also have written about this, this um, double bind where using drugs or overeating actually leads to brain change that then makes it harder to stop using drugs and overeating. So it's a vicious cycle. Yes. So once you start to change the brain in the direction of wanting to, you know, move where you, where you develop, you know, loss of control and compulsive 
eating or compulsive drug use, what happens biologically is that these, the, the receptors that are located in your reward pathway become desensitized. Mm -hmm. So there are fewer of these receptors and they're not so sensitive anymore. So what does that mean? It means you feel things are kind of dull and boring mm -hmm. and you require ever higher levels of stimulation in order to feel alive or to feel satiated. So, you know, you need more drug to feel the same degree of stimulation. You need more food to feel satiated. And when you do that, the receptors further lose their sensitivity mm. and they start to decrease in number. And then you end up in this vicious spiral where it creates more and more compulsive use. So if someone recognizes themselves in that, is there hope that you can, by changing your behavior, re-alter the structure of your brain and, you know, increase your receptors once again? Absolutely. That's the critical thing. The brain is plastic. It's neuroplastic. Our brains are constantly interacting with the environment mm -hmm. inside and outside. And, you know, we're exquisitely sensitive to the influence of events in our environment. And our brains are living. Mm. It's not a machine where, you know, you turn the knob and it's set and it stays there. It's constantly, you know, changing. The neurons, the connections between neurons are being formed and then pruned. And so the um, changes that take place when you expose people to drugs and when they get addicted, those changes largely are reversible. So mm. if you stop using drugs and let's say you stop eating these calorie-rich foods and you eat a more let's say, healthy diet, you know, where you're basically eating very low on the food chain, and low calorie dense foods, like, you know, let's say fresh foods, you know, um, where you have to cook them mm -hmm. and you're using, you're using ingredients as you actually find them in nature, fruits and vegetables and chicken and fish and beef. I mean, these are, you know, these are foods where the nutrients, you know, are present at the levels that we've been used to over many, many hundreds of thousands of years, if you do that, mm -hmm. then the receptors in your brain will start to return back to their baseline. Mm -hmm. And you'll find normal foods and normal experiences once again pleasurable. And the craving will cease. That's so helpful, both to understand that there is a future in which your brain will function differently and you can have the power to affect change, but also that there, there is a transition period. You're not just going to flip a switch and it'll be, oh, now I'm done with drugs and my brain is the same. No, there's an adjustment. There's an adjustment. And also you have to learn, you literally have to have your brain rewired and you have to mm -hmm. learn how to live your life without those things. And so in the interim, many people say, well, how can I do that? Because it's so painful. You know, how, how long is it going to take my brain to become, you know, to, for this neuroplasticity to kick in where right. I'm not going to create these things. And so, you know, it takes weeks and months and sometimes longer, but it does happen. The trick is figuring out some kind of solution, you know, socially and behaviorally Mm -hmm. in order to deal with the uh, discomfort during the transition from, let's say, addiction to addiction-free life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Finding a bridge. Yes. Yeah. That makes total sense. And that that might not be something you'll need for your entire life, but for that transition period, it's increasingly important because you're rewiring your brain and you might need additional support that you did not have Otherwise. Right. And, and you have to, you know, understand that much of, you know, addiction, whether it's food or it's drugs, is learned behavior. And it involves not just the fact that, you know, your circuits have been hijacked, but actually it's a pathological form of learning. Hmm. You know, people learn, they think that they can go back over and over and get the same pleasure, whether it's a drug or it's food. But when you talk to people who are addicted, they're basically not experiencing pleasure. What they're doing is they are hopelessly trying to achieve something that reminds them of the first time they used the drug, mm -hmm. which can never be recaptured. Mm -hmm. But the brain is fooled into thinking that 
you know, if you only use more of the stuff, you're going to get that same wonderful feeling you did at the beginning, but you're not. So people are basically using it in order to prevent feeling bad. It's not that they feel so good. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's all kinds of things along the way that happen where you start to associate people, places, events with those drugs or, let's say, foods. And you have to learn to avoid those those cues that are linked mm -hmm. to the to the thing you want to avoid, like the drug. So you don't go to the bars where you use the drug, or you don't hang out with the people that you use this drug with. Then you don't go to the places where you use the drug because all of those cues mm -hmm. can elicit craving. Right, right. You've you've primed your brain when you you yeah. encounter that cue. You're going you to experience learn, right, and that, and that cue is linked with the experience of using the drug. And the cue by itself, lumish craving. Mm. It's amazing. I mean, this whole process, it, it's relatable, obviously, on the level of drug use, but even for someone who, you know, in a different context, maybe they're trying to recapture the, the way they first felt when they started dating someone or, you know, oh, I just want to feel this same way again. And you try and you try and you try. And one day you kind of wake up and you realize this is not working. What I'm doing is not working. <laughs> it's not, right. it's not functional. And right. it can be really scary not knowing, okay, well, I know what I'm doing is not working, but this is everything I've learned and taught myself how to do. So in order to unlearn this, I have to jump out into the unknown. Right. And you have to have people help you hmm. who actually do know how to make things better and, you know, seek out people in support groups who've been through the experience who can teach you and, and show you what their experience is like. And then you can see it's not so scary. You're not alone. It's common. People do grapple with this and they figure out how to deal with it. That is such a good point. And it also ties into a column that you wrote about this belief that either that people who deal with addiction, they're either totally in control or they're totally powerless. And that there's this black and white dichotomous thinking that isn't really accurate. And you wrote, the myth has persisted that addiction is either a moral failure or a hardwired behavior, that addicts are either completely in command or literally out of their minds. And so if neither of those things are entirely true, what is a more accurate way of talking about personal agency and talking about, you know, what can a person control who is addicted? Right, right. Wonderful question. Thanks. So while we don't really have control of our feelings and our cravings and our mm -hmm. desires, and those things vary a lot depending upon, you know, our individual drive, the, the set points in our brain, you know, things that we don't have much control over, you know, we don't get to control our genes mm -hmm. um, or the nature of our desires or drives, but we do have some control, some control over what we do in response to that. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's a complicated interaction between, you know, the environment and the impact of the environment on our individual psychology and our individual drive. So what I would say to the people on one side who believe just say no will suffice. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't actually work empirically. You know, we, we've been down that road and we've tried programs that are like that. Dare yes. is like that, for example. Yes. You know, authority figures telling young people not to use drugs produces actually the opposite response, which is kids are notoriously defiant. And, you know, if an adult says, don't do this, they do this. Yes. So, you know, it's psychologically bad and it doesn't work. Um, you know, what does seem more effective, actually, in trying to help kids, you know, understand the risks is a peer, somebody in their mm. group who had an experience who knows the dangers and comes back to them and says, you know, hey, you know, I like you once thought about doing this, but look what happened to me. You know, I got into a car accident and I lost my leg or I became paralyzed or, you know, and this is a terrible, terrible thing. It's not fun mm -hmm. and it's dangerous. And, and that has a much bigger impact on young people than, you know, moral scolding. So I think on the one side, if you just say it's a matter of moral fiber and it's all a matter of you know just character and control that completely um misses all of the biological mm. evidence and data we have that there are differences really differences between people 
who get addicted easily and those who don't. Mm -hmm. Most people who try drugs casually do not become addicts. Right. The people who become addicts have something different about them genetically. And we know this. And there mm -hmm. are factors that make people more likely to go in the direction of compulsive use when they're exposed once or twice. Most people mm -hmm. can try a drug and never see it again or try it again. They can have a glass of wine at a party. They don't lose control. But mm -hmm. there are some people that once they start, they do lose control. Mm -hmm. And the, presumably some of the reasons behind that have to do with biological you know, and genetic differences between people. So it's not just a matter of moral fiber. Sure. Um, you know, unfortunately, life is unfair. You know, some people have won yeah. and some people have lost the genetic sweepstakes. You know, and if you've got a genetic loading to make you more vulnerable to enjoy drugs or use them from the very beginning, you have a strike against you. And mm -hmm. it doesn't mean you're powerless. It just means that you have to be aware that you've got this vulnerability and act accordingly. So where does agency come in? Well, for somebody like that, it might be knowing that once they open the door a crack, it could be wide open. Mm -hmm. Once they go down the path and they start and they have that first drink, they've, they've started, they've kicked the ball down, they've kicked the rock down the mountain, and before they know it, there's just going to be you know, a stampede. Mm -hmm. And they're going to they're gonna move very quickly to loss of control. Mm -hmm. Wow, it, it's amazing how it, it really comes down to knowing yourself and accepting the particular hand that you've been dealt because obviously, as you were saying, some people have more vulnerability than others in addiction, but, you know, some people have more vulnerability than others mentally or psychologically or like there's so many levels of it. Right. Right. To the people who believe it's just a matter of moral character, usually those are people who don't have the problem. So right. they, don't, they can't experience this as feeling out of control because they've never had that experience. So they imagine, mm -hmm. well, if somebody does it, they must be like me, and they choose to do it. But I would say to them, why on earth would somebody want to be addicted or mm -hmm. lose control? or eat to the point where they're so obese they can't sit in a movie theater seat or get on an airplane. Mm. That makes no sense whatsoever. There are reasons that go beyond just moral fiber and character that explain this kind of behavior, this compulsive use. And much of that is neurobiological and genetic. Yes. And as a, as a fun side note, I can remember the, the D.A.R.E. assemblies that was right in my era of elementary school and the T-shirts and all of that. So I could relate perfectly to the model that you're describing of the authority yeah. figures just telling you, don't do it. <laughs> it's not a good idea. Right. Well, that's like putting a sign on it saying this might be really interesting. Try it. <laughs> it doesn't work. Yes. Yes. And I also wanted to touch on the question of trauma. So speaking about vulnerability to addiction, and we know that folks who have significant early life trauma often have a greater vulnerability for drug yes. addiction. So you had written a column about the pulse shooting and how some of the some of the beliefs that we have about trauma are helpful and some are not. So for example, people don't always think about the idea that it's helpful to preserve the physical locations where traumatic losses can occur, and it's not always helpful to debrief right after. So can you talk a bit more about how to work with folks who have been through trauma effectively? Right, so, you know, there was most, first of all, most people who are experience, who experience a trauma do just fine. Mm -hmm. You know, a very small number of people actually develop post-traumatic stress disorder where they have pathological fear responses in the future to things that are like the trauma. Mm -hmm. But they're, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a real number. But, but the majority of people who are exposed to a traumatic event, while they're acutely traumatized and really upset, after about a couple of weeks, they're just fine. They do not have PTSD. Mm -hmm. But for people that do go on to develop PTSD, you know, the thing that happens after, and people have studied this, if you, if you take a group of people who've been exposed to, let's say, a shooting or a trauma, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you try to debrief them, which is a well-intended you know, intervention where you go and you try to get them to talk, to talk about their feelings and their experiences, um, it, it paradoxically has the opposite effect. 
Mm. It does not prevent PTSD, and it may actually interfere with the person's ability to um, to cope with and deal with the traumatic emotional event. Because people have their individual way of doing it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. In some ways, it may be very stimulating to do that, and it may it may unwittingly increase the risk of trauma because what you're doing is you're making the person relive it in their mind, and so the memory is burned in even more deeply oh. by the debriefing. Mm -hmm. So what's better is just to reassure people that this terrible thing has happened, you know, and you get all the people who are close to them and their families who love them and you know, take care of them, and you say, you know, you're going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And then you say, now a small number of people who get traumatized develop this problem with you know, PTSD down, down the line, and these are the symptoms, and if you develop any of these, it's treatable and we can help you. Mm -hmm. But making them go through their emotional responses over and over in, in response to the trauma is not preventative of PTSD, and it doesn't help people adjust any faster. Mm -hmm. They should be left alone to be supported, and of course, if they want to talk about it, by all means, but, you know, to to you know, sort of force a one-size-fits-all. It's a model that's based on the cathartic idea that mm. talking is always good. Expressing <laughs> feelings, even if you don't want to do it, is always good. <laughs> yeah, it's not. I am. Um, I'm married to a very introverted man who would strongly agree with that. Of you know. He's not expression for expression's sake. So I can, yeah. re I can really appreciate that. But then, of course, I have friends and family members who really do have much more of a need to verbally process things. But it goes right. back to what you're saying. It's an individual basis. Yes. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to just touch briefly as we're wrapping up on the overprescription of opioids and how that has contributed to the opioid crisis and right. the ways in which as you mentioned, more and more people are dying of drug overdoses. So right. there's been a shift in the attitude of the medical profession using opioid drugs to treat pain. So can you tell us a bit about what precipitated this change? Why did doctors start prescribing opioids more often? How did this all get started? So what happened was basically there was an emphasis. Doctors were seen to be insensitive to patients who had pain. Mm -hmm. So there was a shift in terms of the field, both on the part of educating doctors and the regulatory agencies that were accrediting hospitals. So pain was now considered one of the vital signs. And mm -hmm. there was a mission that doctors had to pay attention to patients with pain and adequately and quickly treat pain. Mm -hmm. And you know their responsiveness to pain was then part of the evaluation of the hospital. So oh. If you didn't attend to patients in pain and relieve their pain quickly, you got lower grades, lower marks. Mm -hmm. So they were encouraging physicians. Now, part of it was well intended because you know we don't want people to suffer. But what happened was that happened at the same moment that the drug companies were making these powerful synthetic opiates like oxycontin, mm -hmm. which is oxycodone, which is a very, very powerful synthetic opioid. So these two things, hand in hand, drug companies then found a perfect market for their product mm -hmm. and a very receptive one because after all physicians are now being told hey you're not treating pain seriously treat it the problem is most pain does not require opiates yeah you know i mean i i had minor hand surgery i'm a swimmer and i tore a ligament doing some dumb thing in a pool and they gave mm -hmm. me 90 days worth of percocet wow. i think i took one the day after surgery and i thought well this is this is completely unnecessary. Mm -hmm. These are great doctors, mm -hmm. but you know why? Why is this? Why am I? This is like giving a, you know using a cannon to, to, to kill a fly. Yes. You know the fact is most people with chronic pain don't do better on opiates than they do on drugs like ibuprofen, Motrin, mm -hmm. or physical mm -hmm. therapy. So part of the part of the problem is doctors over prescribing because of this change in attitude. And the other was they were being encouraged to do it by all the regulations. Mm. Um, now, hopefully, pendulum will swing in the other direction that's a little more rational, in which you train doctors to recognize most pain responds just as well to less addictive, safe alternatives, and that we should not be promiscuous in prescribing opiates. 
Yes, you had a good line talking about opiates can be very effective for short-term pain relief, but that long-term and non-malignant pain responds just as well, if not better, to the safer alternatives. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that is great to hear and very encouraging, I know, for... I actually recently had a medical procedure too, and I got a prescription for Percocet, and I thought, this seems like overkill. <laughs> had this similar yes, experience. Probably is. Yeah. Um, so just as we're wrapping up our time, any final words of wisdom or encouragement for our listeners who are dealing with addiction or have a loved one dealing with addiction? Yes, I, I think that the future is really bright for addiction. I mean, it's one of the it's one of the problems, one of the human behaviors that we know more about than almost any other. Mm-hmm. And there are really effective treatments for addiction, and it really should be considered a illness, not a moral failure. Mm-hmm. And we don't want to stigmatize. We want to encourage people to see this as a failure to adapt mm-hmm. and, and a very, very interesting, complicated relationship between our own individual you know, biology and the environment. And that there's a lot that can be done to actually treat people who are addicted and make them well and make them no longer addicted. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. It has been a real pleasure today. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.